Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Queens College Assistant History Professor Kristen Cilello to the program. Her latest book, Making Marriage Work, just published by the University of North Carolina Press, is both a history lesson and a sociological one. We have lots to talk about here. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Cheryl. Kristen, in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, Tevye asked his wife, Goldie, do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Goldie, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we learned to love each other. And now I'm asking, Goldie, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know, but do you love me? Do I love him? For 25 years, I've lived with him, fought him, starved with him. 25 years, my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? Then you love me? I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. Do those lyrics speak to the thesis of your book? I think they very much do. Um, although a, a little bit different, because in the 20th century United States, most folks would have uh, probably met their husbands and wives prior to their wedding day. But very much, there's, I think, my book talks a lot about the aspirations of American couples really over the past hundred years to, to find a place in their relationship, which is their marriage relationship, which is uh, personally satisfying and loving. And if that love isn't there, to find a way to work at it, to, to recapture that feeling that they had mm -hmm. from those early heady days of courtship and early marriage, the honeymoon phase, as it were. The title of your book could be read in two ways. It could be read as making marriage work or making marriage work. Mm -hmm. um, was that your intention? It was, in fact. The title itself is drawn from a uh, uh, an advice column that ran in the Ladies Home Journal. It started in the late 1940s that was actually called Making Marriage Work. That was by a psychologist from Penn State University. Uh, but I like the fact that there are these double meanings. You have making marriage work the noun, whereby making it something that you need to put effort into to mm -hmm. have it be successful, as well as making marriage work uh, the adjective in terms of making it successful, mm -hmm. having a marriage, how do, you, how do you find a way to make the marriage successful? So I, I like the fact that it has that, that double meaning mm -hmm. as well as a historical reference. What led you to write the book? The book was based uh, on my dissertation that I wrote while I was at, at the University of Virginia. Uh, and I really, I came at the topic from, an, from a somewhat different perspective than you might think. I actually was initially interested in studying weddings and the ritual and, and the sort of, all, all the sort of emotions that, that go into planning a wedding and what have you. Um, and I was having a really hard time getting traction on that. And my advisor said, what about the end of marriage? Why don't you look there instead? Mm -hmm. And as I was doing, so I started looking at divorce, which is the opposite of studying weddings. Uh, but, but as I studied divorce, I came to realize that uh, there's been a constant tension in, in US history when it comes to marriage lots of fear about divorce and marriages ending on the one hand, and a real desire to have a happy, successful relationship on the other. And I think that that tension is really something I found interesting and that I wanted to, to learn more about. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that other people would be interested in learning about that as well. You write that it was not until the 1920s that various experts, whoever they were in this country, started defining and shaping marriage as something that needed to be worked on. So how was marriage perceived of before then? Did, was it not something that you worked on before then? And what led to the change? That's something I spent a lot of time thinking about because it's, it's difficult to sort of pinpoint these key changes. But I think in the, in the earlier time periods, and particularly in the 1800s, it wasn't that people didn't aspire to have happy marriages, but they really saw marriage as a duty. It was something that you did uh, it was sort of fated to be happy or not happy. Women spent a long time choosing who they wanted to marry in the hopes that they would make the right choice. 
But after the fact, there was sort of this idea that it was your duty and there was nothing you could do to change it or you didn't really have an out if it didn't live up to your expectations. Right. But the 1920s, the, the divorce has always been legal in the United States, but it, it, more, more and more people were getting divorced in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the religious, a lot of religious leaders in particular who had led the conversation about marriage in the, in the 1800s kept just talking about, well, should we outlaw divorce or not? And that no longer spoke to the American public who, mm -hmm. who believed that divorce was something people should have a right to. So this group of experts uh, who were sort of from a variety of fields uh, started to step into the conversation and say, we have, we're going to find a way to perfect marriage and make it something that's protected from divorce, even if divorce is legal. Now, you, you note in your book that as far back as the 1880s, the United States led the world in divorces back then. So why this sudden emphasis on preventing divorces in the 1920s, do you think? I think what happened in the 1920s was that it started to become evident that divorce was not something that was just practiced by the very rich. There's a lot of scandals. Divorce is in the newspaper a lot in the 1800s when very wealthy people get divorced and then there's custody fights and it's very dramatic. Uh, or that it was something that, that poor folks did, although they didn't always get divorced, desertion was really considered a problem as well. What happens in the 1920s is the divorce rate is announced to be one in seven marriages end in divorce, and it becomes evident that it's also something that has spread to the middle class. And so a much it's no longer just something for the very rich or the very poor. And that middle class is something that experts thought as being sort of the backbone of American society. And if they were getting divorced, we were perhaps there was a, a crisis coming, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about the development of marriage education courses in colleges and universities in the late 20s. Um, how did those come about and what did they teach in those courses? Those courses came about uh, often by student demand. The students were aware of the fact that there was this looming crisis of divorce and they started to ask, especially their sociology professors and psychology professors, could you teach us something that's more practical? You know, we learn about theories in your classroom, but we want a class that's going to teach us how do you find a mate? How do you decide what qualities are right? How, once you get married, how do you deal with issues of, uh, is the wife going to work for a while after she's married? Is she not? When do you decide to have children? Those sorts of things. And so these courses were unique on college campuses because they were very practical mm -hmm. in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the stuff I, I found some, syllabi and assignments from these classes, which were pretty amusing with, uh, they always taught single sex, even at a co-ed school, there would be a male section and a female section. Mm -hmm. and I found homework from a male section where they had to write their ideal mate and then their, their okay mate, the mate they would be acceptable. Right. And so all, they all had written blonde, voluptuous on their idea that it was brunette right. was the realistic one. Right. So, <laughs> So and nothing has changed, so right? That, yes, exactly. <laughs> Although the teachers also positioned themselves. They always let the students know that they were available for one-on-one -on -one talking. And they really felt that the, if they could instruct these students how to be, to what to expect when they got married, that uh -huh. they, would, they would be less likely to get divorced in the future. Now, I suspect a lot of the, what, what, a lot of what the college students wanted to know was about sex, and they probably weren't getting any place yes. and probably didn't get it into college courses either. They got it more so than you would think. Really? And there was always something that was touchy for professors to sort of decide how they were going, how they were going to do it. You know, in the 1920s, it's still illegal to distribute birth control information, and so they had to find ways to sort of to touch on the issue without so, without offending anyone's sensibilities <laughs> right. or getting arrested. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, so there usually was a very sort of biological sexual component to the class. Mm -hmm. And the professors sometimes would complain that the students weren't interested in the long histories they wanted to tell and, and all the intricacies of, of, you know, how they should choose their mates and that they really wanted to kind of get to the sexual right. information I, as soon I as possible. They did. But, but yeah, and then obviously that was also as these classes moved into the cl high school classroom in the 1950s that again sort of how much should there be sex education mm -hmm. was is very long debate about that right right because god forbid you should tell any kids about anything about sex in a sex education right. course <laughs> exactly you know so who was paul popano and what role did he play in promoting the idea of marriage's work paul popano uh He's a gentleman who has received a lot of attention from historians over the past decade or so. He's a really fascinating character. 
he was in my book he he pops up in, most importantly as the the face and the founder of the famous ladies home journal column uh, can this marriage be saved which is the longest single running monthly column in a magazine and still running and still running today you can go on l what is it lhj.com and you will always can this marriage be saved is right there and it's in the print magazine as well and he was one of the founders of the first marriage counseling clinics in the United States. Uh, it opened in LA in the late, it, the date's sketchy, either 1929 or 1930. Uh, he had a previous career as a eugenicist, uh, as someone who promoted sterilization in particular uh, in the state of California. But while he wanted to sterilize the unfit, he also thought that people who, young couples should have more babies who he deemed fit, should have more babies, should get married. And he wanted to find a way to help them to make find those the right marriages, couple. find the right couple. Right. And he really becomes an own, his own brand. He's, I have a, a, there's a picture in the book of him on the set of his uh, TV show, Divorce Hearing which was uh, syndicated in the late 50s and was the first I saw that ever I'd never heard of that the show first before. ever divorce court you know now it's it's still on i can right, watch it when right, i'm at the gym right. you know there's divorce courts always on at like 11 o'clock on in weekday mornings and he was the pioneer of that and the whole point of that show was to have couples who were going to get divorced on so they could be a lesson to the viewers right their marriages right. had been had gone too far but he was going to give them a little lecture and tell viewers how to avoid those problems. The column, Can This Marriage Be Saved, how, how has that influenced Americans' view of marriage over time? I would think it has been, would have been very, very influential. I, I, I argue it. I believe it was, certainly. Uh, the column has been the same for a very long time. It always starts with a he, she said and then a he said so that both members of the couple sit, talk about what their what their marital problems are, and then the counselor speaks at the end. And the first, in the first seven or eight years of Can This Marriage Be Saved, which is a question mark, Can This Marriage Be Saved, question mark, every single marriage was Can saved. Be saved. Well, Can okay. be saved. Okay. They did run a This Marriage <laughs> Couldn't Be Saved once in sort of the mid 50s. And Readers that didn't was like a while. No, <laughs> apparently not. Because he very much, um, every marriage, and what it, what it said, and this is something that was, was very true in the 1950s, was that there was no problem too big that couples couldn't work through it. Mm -hmm. And particularly that the wife couldn't work through it. Right. And you see that when you read the column. She tells her story. He responds, oftentimes very defensively. Right. And then when the counselor speaks, the counselor most often speaks about how she could change right. things, what and she could do. And basically, you say basically, that's been the message from since the, the 1920s marriage takes work and it's the wife who has to do yes. the work. Yes, because you know, for, for many years, the experts assumed that women needed marriage more than men, that mm -hmm. both for financial reasons, which there was something right. to that, right. particularly prior to the 1970s, and then also for emotional re reasons as well, that they were more invested. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, the husband had to go off and work, and so they, their work, part of their household duties, was ensuring that the marriage was, was satisfying to marriage. and to work at the marriage, right. above and beyond just childcare or housekeeping. Right, right. And, and we'll talk about that more after right. our short break when I'll be back with Kristen Zalello, author of Making Marriage Work, after the following message. Take my hand and start a brand new day And together as one we'll start to see some change Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with my Queens College colleague, Kristen Salello, author of Making Marriage Work, just published by the University of North Carolina Press. You say that this emphasis on making marriage, marriages work, preserving marriages, at least keeping people from getting divorces, which is, was really yes. what it was about, primarily focus on white middle class couples. It was really aimed at them. But I know that African American women have also been recipients of the message that they are responsible for the success of their marriage. You know, that, that, that 
that's their job, and especially so since uh, there are relatively fewer African American marriages, and so you're really there's sort of a a real desperate need to try to hold those together, and that it's her job to do it. Yes, no, and that's I really struggled because I found. Uh, there was no single, a lot of my research is in women's magazines, magazines that are directed towards women, because that's where you find the marriage advice. And there wasn't an African-American magazine directed solely towards women mm -hmm. until Essence comes out in the 70s. Right. And when that happens, immediately there's an explosion of marriage advice articles. And you do find them earlier in Ebony, and, and they oftentimes are written, interestingly enough, by the same experts who you find in magazines that were directed towards white middle class mm -hmm, women. Mm -hmm. And so I, I very much do think that those messages did cut across race, particularly m middle class African Americans and middle class whites. It was very hard for, for me to find that evidence. And it was one of a frustration, in fact. Interesting. Because I think it was, I think it was there, because instinctually we know that that's true, exactly right. what you're talking right. about. World War II saw a huge spike in marriages in the United States, and yet the divorce rate started to skyrocket at the same time. Talk about, why was that? Talk about that. What happened in, during World War II was that a lot of couples had put off getting married during the Great Depression. They simply didn't have the money to do so. So when the economy starts rebounding, it looks like the U.S. is going to war and men are going to be sent overseas, the marriage rate goes just absolutely through the roof. And some of these marriages experts were very happy about, that couples who had waited so long to, to have econom their economic resources, that that was great, that they had now gotten married and those were going to be successful. The concern was marriages that happened between men and women who'd been swept up in the war and maybe had met two days before he was going to deploy. Under the clock in Grand Central. Under the clock proper. in Grand right. Central, like Judy Garland. And in the movie The Clock. And so that was a real concern. And in fact, what ended up happening was the divorce rate went up, particularly in 1945, 1946, as these men started coming home, they realized they didn't really know their wives so well. And so there's a, a huge the divorce rate in the, the mid to late 40s was higher, the highest until the divorce rate went up again in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so we oftentimes don't think of the, you know, the greatest generation as having gone through this. But there was there was a, a, this spike in divorce mm -hmm. that came from right that after right after the war right. from couples who just didn't know one another anymore. Uh, and just felt like it'd be better to, to start afresh. Starting in the 50s, we started to get this image of the successful wife as a superwoman. She's got to be a diplomat, a businesswoman, a, a good cook, a trained nurse, a school teacher, a politician. If her husband's a, a, an alcoholic, she's got to support him, uh, you know, to help him get out of that. She's got to be a glamour girl. Where did this come from? And didn't that put I put a whole lot of pressure on women? Oh, I think very much so. And like I, as I was saying earlier, the interesting thing is there were such high hopes for marriage in the 1950s, years of depression, years of war, you know, the Cold War's on, and people really turned to the family for stability, and they turned to, to the wife and mother to, to create that, that loving, fun atmosphere and to make sure that everything runs smoothly, and it was a, a tremendous amount of pressure for them. Uh, and that's why they oftentimes turn to marriage advice, you know, marriage counselors and other advice givers to figure out how they could how they could handle mm -hmm. it all. But while the the bar for the, you're supposed to do so many things to be successful, as long as your marriage didn't end in divorce, then it was generally deemed a success. Successful. So that was that was a, a, certainly a problem they fixed. And certainly there was a lot of women who who who, you know, found who really struggled to fulfill all that and to feel like they weren't living up to expectations. Right. Now, the one thing that, that challenged the idea that being married, that it's better to be married than to be single, and that women should work hard at their marriages was the women's movement of the late 60s and the, yes. and the, and the 70s. Uh, and partly as a result of that, divorces started to skyrocket again, right? Some of that had to do with changes, I will say, in the divorce law. It sort of was a perfect storm right. of okay. things. We have the, the rise of what's called no-fault divorce. Uh, whereby previously when you're getting a divorce, when you went to court, you had to prove that one of the spouses had committed a crime right, against the marriage. Right. Uh, the state of California in the late 60s passes a law whereby you no longer have to do that. In fact, it was Ronald Reagan who signed that into law and it was seen at the time as a conservative measure. It was gonna take the acrimony out of divorce. It didn't turn out that way, but that was, that was the plan. 
Um, so we have changes in the law that make it easier for couples to get divorced. And then we have the women's movement that's the, who start to say, they, when the women's movement take over the Ladies Home Journal in the early 70s, they run a should this marriage be saved column. And they start to say, well, maybe there are certain situations whereby if your husband is violent, for instance, the best advice in the 50s was figure out how to not provoke him. Right. And did they run an article, since somebody suggested an article, can this marriage? Yeah. And then they had one. Yeah. And so should this marriage be saved? Can this marriage? Can this exactly. Marriage. That, in fact, there are some marriages that shouldn't Should be not, saved and right. that were. But what I find is interesting is mo there were some uh, more radical feminists who were saying, we need to get rid of marriage altogether. This thing is so, pro the whole institution is problematic. But there were many more who said, let's work within the institution and distribute the work more equally. Right. Why is it that she, that the wife is doing the All vast the quantity of this work? Right. You know, and, and, and I'm not trying, I, the, the book is certainly not about men not being interested in their marriage. And there were plenty of men who wrote letters to Paul Popino wanting to know how they could they could save their marriage. So it's not that men were uninterested, it's just that the general cultural idea or dialogue was about women. And they were saying, let's, let's find a way to distribute this more equally. We know if men are given the chance, they'll want to participate as well. I found it interesting, and you seem to find it interesting as well, that while Hillary Clinton was not particularly popular early in her husband's presidency, uh, when she decided to stick to stand by, stand her, by man her man after the Monica Lewinsky scandal, that there was a lot of popular support for her because of that. Yes, and I think it shows that there are still, that some of those, there's things maybe haven't changed as much as sometimes we think about when, oh, the, the American family is completely different now than it was, you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever. There's still a, a, an understanding that that people can mess up in their marriages and that perhaps it's good for a wife to under, to, to occasionally uh, forgive her husband. Perhaps we're seeing a different change now because many people did applaud Jenny Sanford, for instance, when she decided to divorce her husband, the governor of South Carolina, after his dalliances. But yeah, Hillary Clinton, her numbers went up a lot, particularly amongst women who identified as more conservative. Mm -hmm. And that's something that that in the 1970s, as feminists are saying, let's redistribute this marital work, a lot of conservative women were saying, actually, women just haven't been doing as good a job as they could, and mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to reinvest in if that. If we just work harder. If we just work harder, and, that's, and, that, and they took that specifically as their job. You mm -hmm. know, As mm -hmm. women were moving into the workforce, they felt under siege that people didn't think staying at home with your children and what have you was good enough that right. they were being judged, and they said, listen, look what we're doing for our marriages as well as everything else. And so the, that really helped Hillary Clinton, I think. The big concern now seems to be that if we allow gays to marry, that that's going to undermine uh, heterosexual marriage. There certainly is. And that obviously in the past few years, there have been a lot of conversations about that. But there has, there's a lot of an interesting diversity of, of opinions, I think. There are folks like David Brooks in the New York Times who have argued that heterosexuals aren't doing such a great job at marriage either, you know, with the divorce rate being right. what it is today. And so what what harm will it be if we if homosexuals who want to get married, in fact, choose and to do really so? And who are supporting the institution. Who are supporting the institution, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, certainly there are, there are folks who feel that it's going to undermine marriage, much in the same way that there were concerns in the late 19th century about divorce was going to be the beginning of the end of right. American marriage. And what my book is about is the, the marriage is a very resilient American institution, that Americans still marry more than pretty much anyone else in the world. And they're believers in it, even if they do it, you know, multiple times. That was, that was going to be my next question. So what do you think is going to be the future of marriage in this country? Oh, I'm a historian, so it's always hard. <laughs> you look to the past, to predict. Not, to exactly. the, not to the future. <laughs> exactly. I actually think a marriage is going to has and is, has been is going to remain a fundamental American institution. I, I really do. And it's interesting, in fact, they're uh, getting just for a second back to gay marriage. There's some indication that those marriages 
tend to split the work more equally, and perhaps that will that, gay marriages that, do yes, really? couples and gay marriages tend okay. to. The, most of the research has been done in civil unions in Vermont, and it shows that there's a more. Dis so a lot of folks are saying maybe this is the, that's the wave of the future is that we're going to continue that push towards a more equitable distribution of mm -hmm. marital work. But but I don't think marriage is going anywhere. And the divorce rate reached its high in the late 70s and has since stabilized. Is it one and is it one and two? It's one and two, although that's of all marriages. Mm -hmm. The rate for first marriages is lower than that. Okay. So I tell my students that Elizabeth Ca Taylor counts, you know, each time she got divorced was a new rig into the statistics and so I don't know the exact so number. So she really jacked up she the really divorce did. rate. She did, a hor she did a horrible thing for the nation's <laughs> divorce rate and once people divorce once they're more likely to divorce again and so that does inflate the rate mm -hmm. in some ways but I think there are very few Americans who are going into marriage today or or over the past century who thought, Am I g I'm going to be one of those one and two. Yeah. I think there's an incredible faith, and the marriage advice industry has just exploded in the past 30 years. And now on the internet, you type making marriage work into the internet, really? you're not getting my book. You're getting just thousands of, wow. of websites that are out there to, to help people. Mm -hmm try well, to find those ways. It's going to be interesting to look to, to, just to see what happens to marriage going forward, and I'm sure you're going to keep your eye on it. Very much <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> We're out of time. I want to thank Kristen Solello, author of Making Marriage Work. It's just been published by the University of North Carolina Press. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.